What's going on, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. We have a very fun conversation planned today. Obviously, if you've been following the news, we're going to be talking about the Lumix BS1H box camera. That is the full frame variant of our box style camera that we released last year. And uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of exciting things to talk about this. Uh, I'm going to be joined by Matt Frazier in a few moments uh, where, you know, we're going to be taking all of your questions. We know that there are a bunch of people that have been commenting out on the Facebook groups in our Instagram channel, which as a nice little kind of segue there, if you're not following us over on Instagram, make sure to go over there, take a look, follow us on Instagram, because I do also monitor the chat over there when we're not doing these live streams. Um, but there's been a ton of questions about, you know, why do we have certain pieces built on this camera? Why are we using certain types of inputs and outputs uh, versus what some others would have preferred to see? But ultimately, we want to talk about where this camera fits in the existing lineup, what it's going to mean for those that want to get into something like this and dispel some of the rumors out there uh, or kind of not rumors, dispel some of the opinions out there, maybe, or help uh, maybe better inform some people as to what this camera actually is. Um, before we go into all of that, uh, if you are joining us for the first time on these Lumix Live platforms, these are weekly live broadcasts that we do on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, for the most part, uh, where we talk with photographers, videographers, uh, other members here at Panasonic. So Matt Frazier's joined us a number of times over here. Um, and we just talk about equipment. We talk about technology, new kind of cool things that have come out. We also talk with uh, all of you. So these are interactive streams. I have the chat open here. And the biggest part about this is that you have a direct touch point into Panasonic Lumix USA and Panasonic Lumix as a, as a brand. So you're able to actually ask us questions that you have to get answers direct from the source. And if Matt or I don't know them, one, I'd be very surprised if between Matt and I, we can't get an answer for you. But if we don't know it right here, we're at least able to start, you know, kind of digging into it and finding an answer for you that we can either address on a future stream uh, or we can address in social media or something like that. So um, alongside of that, in order to interact with us on these streams, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras before your question. It will pop up yellow on my side so I can actually see your question. Uh, so it doesn't just look like a wall of text going through. Um, I don't want to miss questions that people have because you're taking the time to actually type them out. Um, what else am I missing? Oh yes, outside of that, I want to remind everybody about the Lumix Pro Services platform. We have two tiers here in the United States, and we have a couple other tiers in other regions uh, across the globe. Uh, in the United States, we have the Red membership, which is a free uh, platform to join in with. That gets you your three-year extended warranty. Uh, it gets you an online platform where you're going to be able to um, actually kind of interact with uh, uh, the product repair cycles if you're having issues with a camera. Um, and just kind of get you the whole setup so that you're, you you know that you've got a good backend support with your product. But for those of you that are more demanding on your equipment and like to have maybe a little bit better peace of mind, we have the Lumix uh, Pro Services Platinum Series. That's a bit of a uh, tongue twister there. Uh, the Platinum Series, it gives you all the cool stuff that you get in the red tier. So you get that three-year manufacturer extended warranty, but you get some nice added benefits. You get two-day repair, uh, two-day repairs with free next-day shipping on both ways, 20% off out of warranty repairs. So situations where you may drop a lens, drop a camera or something that wouldn't be covered under manufacturer uh, warranty, you're getting it 20% off a repair for that. You also get annual sensor cleanings and EVF cleanings, as well as lens calibrations and firmware updates, all that fun stuff. You get a, a direct membership hotline to be able to call into our service team. So you don't necessarily have to deal with a chat or an email system if you prefer to actually speak to someone. Uh, and you get a really cool welcome gift. You get the uh, Lumix Pro Services strap, which is a peak design strap that uh, really kind of, uh, I know a lot of people like the straps that come with cameras. I personally do, but having something like the Peak Design that gets you that nice little clipping system for getting everything up to date is just really, really sick. So without further ado, like we said, we are going to be talking about this guy right here. This is the BS1H box camera. So for those of you that have been following us before, this is a box style interchangeable lens camera. 
Right now I've got it mounted up with my 24 millimeter 1.4. So this, or 1.8, this is the, uh, the new 1.8 series. And just to show you that this is not the BGH-1, which is what I'm filming on right now, there's your lovely sensor. Nice full frame 35 millimeter sensor. So with all of that, and my very long-winded entry, I'm sure a bunch of people are tired of hearing me kind of do my whole spiel here. Let's uh, let's actually bring Matt Matt uh, into the conversation. So, hi Matt, how are you? I know I'm sick of hearing you talk, Sean. I was <laughs> I was just chomping at the bit, so I can say some things too. I like to use my words. <laughs> well. Go ahead, Matt. Um, for those, for people that are just joining us, could you give us a little, uh, like, who, who you are for the company? I know a lot of people know you, but, you know. Yeah, so I work in business development for Panasonic. Um, I, I'm basically trying to help us uh, find different ways to uh, make sure our products are serving the business community as a whole. Um, that's just that's just one of the duties I have. Obviously, you and, you and I do a lot of different things for Panasonic. Um, now, recently... Uh, QCing HDR videos and making sure that they flag correctly might have been one of the things we were originally working on, as a matter of fact. So um, there we go. That that's that's a nice little dead silence for you for a moment. Let's yeah. uh let's get into this though, because um <laughs> I am I have always been full of BS. So now it's time for me to talk some BS one H. So this is gonna be, I think, a good show for us. Yeah. Uh, this camera yeah. clearly knew who I was at the very beginning when they chose to name it. And I believe that was actually uh, uh, one of the things, like the conversations we had when we were, you know, learning about this camera internally is like, you know, how, how, you know, what's the name of it going to be? What's the concept behind it? And I think for, for a lot of people out there, like you, you can start to understand the naming structure now with some of our cameras. I know, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, but you know, a lot of people have been confused by some of our naming structure uh, with our cameras across the board, but yeah. B S one H it's an S one H in a box B G H or B wow B G H one. It's a box G H camera. Um, yeah. so could you, what, what's probably like the most, you know, kind of call out cool thing that, that you personally like about the camera so far before we go and just, you know, kind of do what everyone else has done and just read down a spec list. Yeah. I think that's, that's kind of difficult for me to answer. Um, for me, I, I love the form factor of the BGH-1 and the BS-1H. Um, it's a little less apparent, the weight savings of a BGH-1 versus like a GH-5, I'm sorry, versus a GH-5S. But it's a very stark difference in weight between the BS-1H and the S-1H. And so um, in between the weight savings and the size reduction, those are probably the things I'm most excited about for it. Also for rigging purposes, um, I, I think for anybody who's shooting gimbal, I think they're gonna absolutely love this camera because I mean, it is a perfect square when it's you know left, right, top, bottom. It's nearly a perfectly squared cube in terms of its overall shape. Would you say and that so, it's a box? <laughs> I, you could say that it is a box, although <laughs> I don't know why people are so afraid to say the term box. I've heard people call it a cube. I've heard people say it's a block. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know why people avoid the term box, but yes, it is absolutely a box shaped camera. So um, from, a, from a gimbal perspective alone, I think it's just amazing how much easier it is to work with this product than it is uh, a mirrorless style or a DSLR style camera. Um, you know, that's probably the number one thing for me. Uh, I get, somewhat frustrated balancing out an S1H, um, especially if I'm at a retailer. Cause I, you know, Sean, you and I will have people like we were at Cinegear and some guy walks up to us with a June crane and you know, like I'm the expert on every gimbal that's ever been made. And I'm trying to help him balance out his gimbal. And the reality is this gimbal was just entirely too small for the camera he was shooting. And so we couldn't scoot it to the right, you know, far enough to handle the grip yeah. um, in order to offset the weight. Uh, I don't have to worry about any of those issues with the with the BGH one as long as my or the BS one H as long as I keep the lenses properly sized. You know, I don't I don't know yeah. if I'd want to combine a seventy to two hundred f two eight constant on a gimbal and expect it to balance out too well. But we have lots of lenses that make a lot of sense on gimbals, and this body is perfect for them. Yeah, and you know, I we we were talking about this before, and I think that's actually you know kind of one of the 
one of the points that actually has me really, really excited about this camera is that, you know, I, I love my S1H. I love my S1. Everyone that's been following us knows that I love my S1R. They're amazing cameras and they're great for what they're built for. But I, you know, I, I use this gimbal here, it's a RSC2, um, that I use for, for a lot of various different things. Um, I am by no means a, a filmmaker, but being able to just slap the, the uh, BS1H onto that thing and then know that our entire F1.8 series of lenses, all I'm doing now is just changing out the focal length that I want. I'm not having to have to rebalance this thing. I'm not having to, you know, worry like, well, am I going to have to, you know, how, as you said, how far over can I push this camera and can I actually get it balanced or am I going to be stressing out the motors because, you know, I can't really get it perfectly balanced. I, ultimately, I think it means a lot for people who want to actually be able to get incredibly high quality but don't necessarily have the money or the desire to dump a ton of money into a higher end gimbal because these things get expensive. Yeah. Um, and this one's not that expensive of a version. Um, I think it's nice, especially because it has like, you know, the active track functionality with a bunch of our cameras. So it's a pretty sick little, uh, pretty sick little addition there. Yeah. I also think when you look at the price of the camera, you know, it's a, it's a $3,500 retail, um, sorry, thirty four ninety nine and 99 cents. Um, so for that price point to have access to an SDI port, uh, well, let's start with, you have a full frame sensor that can actually shoot in open gate, yes. which there are cinema cameras that don't have the ability to do open gate on a full frame sensor. Uh, you know, that that's rarefied air, right? You're really talking about the LF, um, series from Airy. We're talking about the Sony Venice. Um, even like Red Monstro is in a 16 by 9 or 17 by 9 aspect ratio sensor. So it's not going to give you that same sort of real estate. So having that open gate function is incredibly appealing, especially for anamorphic work. But you have that kind of power in a $3,500 price point that gives you an SDI port. Um, I realize the S1H gives you a time code port. So does this camera. Um, it's time code port is just a bit more easy to work with um, <clears throat> because that whip that we put on the side of the camera for the, the little cable we give you, um, you're always worried because it doesn't quite screw into the PC port it's tight enough for me. Um, so it's always kind of flopping around. Um, not that that's a big deal. I've never had issues with time code sync, but having a dedicated TC port on the back is really useful. But the addition of Genlock, I think, really sort of changes the game a lot for a product like this in the full frame space, especially at $3,500. Um, this sort of combination of I.O. makes it a very appealing product. And then when you add in the Ethernet port, um, which has the ability to do either 4K or TSP streaming, or it can do camera control, or it can do camera control while doing RTSP streaming, you have all of this sort of combination of features that make this camera really useful for a lot of different situations. Um, will it work as a cinema camera? Absolutely, it'll work as a cinema camera. And you can use it just like you would a RED or like you'd use, you know, obviously there's gonna be a lot of comparisons to Zcam products. So it can absolutely work in that way or like what an, what an Alexa Mini would be, um, a, a box style, smaller compact camera that you can rig up the way you want to. But you can then take that camera and change it from being a cinema style product or a production camera, and you can turn it into a live event camera very easily. Uh, I think the latest thing I'm probably in incredibly excited about is the work we've been doing with a company called Data Video. Um, yes. And Data Video, Data Video makes uh, pan tilt camera, pan tilt zoom cameras, and they make controllers for pan tilt zoom cameras, and they make a pan tilt head called the PTR10 uh, Mark II. And so we've been working with them to ensure that the BS1H and the BGH1, um, they'll be able to control through our remote port on the side, um, the lens iris control, you'll be able to control power zoom lenses on the BGH1 through it. Um, you know, access to things like uh, exposure control, uh, even tally information um, we can send back through that port. And so we've been working with them to integrate a lot of that control. Um, but there's one axis that's missing in a PTZ when you use a BS1H or a BGH1, and that's the zoom. 
um, because most of the lenses people want to use are not power zoom lenses. So we've actually worked to get them in contact with Tilta, um, who make the Nucleus M. And so what they're working on is an integration of the Tilta Nucleus M that will connect directly into their pan tilt head. And then you can connect that to our lens. And now you can do zoom right from their remote operator panel in their PT head. So it makes for a incredible quality pan tilt zoom product. And frankly, for the price, you're not going to find anything close to this quality for yeah. anywhere near the price you'll pay for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I want to actually address some of the questions that uh, people sure. have been asking in here. So um, just as a reminder, if you have questions for Matt or myself, uh, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras before it. Um, we'll go through and answer as many of them as we can throughout the uh, broadcast today. So uh, let's hear the first one that I had come up here was from Redbit. Uh, and the question was, can I use both the BGH1 and the BS1H controlling them simultaneously with the R, uh, remote control software? And uh, yes, 100% you can. Um, I know, Matt, you touched on that a little bit before, but I think that's one of the cooler, you know, kind of parts with this whole setup is that we already laid a lot of the groundwork with the BGH1. The Tether from Multicam software has been out. That's already inherently been able to give you control over up to 12 cameras if you're over Ethernet or USB. Um, but yeah, plugging in a, a BS1H right onto my own network here, I've been able to just easily flip between the two cameras, change all the settings. Um, I'm able to have every piece of control that I'd want over it. Uh, and the other cool thing is that when you have all of them selected, so I have, I only have two cameras here, but I had both of them set up. Uh, and then in the software, just click the record button when I've got all cameras selected and it sends the record trigger to all of the cameras that are being selected. So it legitimately yeah. allows you to have, you know, a micro four thirds camera if you want to do ultra telephoto long reach of something and then have your full frame camera to be, you know, your wider angle field of view if you're doing like coverage or something like that or you want to get that more shallow depth of field. It, it's yeah. a pretty sick combination. Or even the opposite way where you use the BS1H as your close-up camera. So you get that really shallow depth of field on, you know, your isolated shots, your your two inter your interviewer and your interviewee, while you're on a multiple BGH ones for covered shots, two shots, things like that. I mean, uh, there's a lot of benefits to doing it. I, I do want to make people aware that you're not gonna have quite all of the same uh, batch control that you would have if it was all BGH1, because there are some resolution feature differences between the two cameras. Some things we can do with one that we can't do with other, you know, notably 6K can't be done with the BS1.8 or oh, can't yeah. be done with the BGH1. So um, you're not gonna be able to batch populate all the camera settings to all of them simultaneously, but you can do certain selections batch to all of them and then individually adjust all of them, you know, on the, on the network as needed. So yeah, it's a pretty awesome, it's a pretty awesome setup, no doubt about it. Yeah. So let's see here. A uh, couple other questions we've got in here. Um, Keith is asking, do we have a table comparing features of the S1H and a BS1H? Um, I don't like a terrific have... job for Sean Robinson. Hey, it, Sean, it why don't we have you with a chart? So I'm going to get uh, on that and actually get one of those. Uh, I'll find somewhere that we can post it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably just create it and throw it over on a couple of the Facebook groups because I know um, I know a lot of you join us from over there. So, um, yeah, I can uh, take a look and see what I can put together and send it over to you. So glad I, vol so glad I volunteered you for that, Sean. Uh, it's fine. It's my job. Uh, oh, let's see. <laughs> let's see By the way, here. I want to call out uh, Caleb Pike is on here right now. Hi, Caleb. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry we didn't. Sorry, we didn't get you a BS1H. That was on me. You can blame me for that one. Um, we only had four samples for the entire United States. So um, don't don't worry, Caleb. I, I I have another special camera ready for you. You know, a little bit later on. So we'll, we, don't 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 fret. I I, ha I have you in mind for another camera coming. Let's see here. Um, uh, another question. Uh, any news about an S1H Mark II? Um, as we normally say, and we've always commented on these streams, we, we don't talk about future products that haven't been announced um, because until you see the company announce something, there is nothing. So, uh, yeah, fortunately, yeah, 
nothing there. So, uh, Keith, Keith also asks on the BS one H does 4k 60 P require a crop? Um, yes. Uh, it is the, basically the same internals as the S one H. Uh, it's the same sensor. Uh, think, yeah, it's pretty right, Matt. It's like, everything's the same as an S one H just in the box form factor with different IO and really kind of designed for a different purpose than a typical yeah, S one H. Yeah, I think people need to kind of look at what we're seeing in the market right now when it comes to how cameras are getting to faster frame rates. They're either reducing the resolution of the sensor um, in order to get a faster readout speed if it's full frame, or they're going to really high resolution sensors and then they are line skipping or binning or a combination of both to get to that 60p in a full frame sensor or they're putting a cinema sensor that's bespoke manufactured for it and the price point is ridiculously high. So um, the sensors that are available uh, in full frame that are cost effective for a product at a $3,500 price point, um, they just don't have the readout speed to be able to give you a uh, full frame readout at 60 frames per second. It's just, just a fact. Um, and that's a benefit of the micro four thirds standard is that the sensors are smaller, their readout speeds are faster. There's just no way of getting around that. Um, yeah. I, I, I know a lot of people want to talk GH6. We've already re revealed one spec, which is 4K 120 of that camera. Um, so that should give you some idea of, you know, how much faster we can make the readout speed in a micro fourth third sensor. I know some people are going to point out some other cameras in the, in the chat here in a little bit, but again, keep in mind, if they're doing 4K 60, they're either binning and skipping, or they have less than 24 megapixels resolution, which means they don't have the ability to do like 6K video. You're going to be more limited to 4K. So it's it's a balancing act for us. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely a, a, a really good point. You know, we've, even though we're talking so much about the BS1H today, you know, the the next question it was actually asked in here was, it was really more of a statement about wanting firmware updates for the GH5. You know, today isn't just about the BS1H. We did also make an announcement right after the uh, BS1H announcement that was uh, about the BGH1, the GH5S, and the G9. Uh, they will be getting firmware updates uh, in the first week of November. I think it's November 4th. Um, that is going to be adding B-RAW to the GH5S and the BGH1. And then... Across all three of them, they're also getting some of the uh, linear focus control for uh, a number of lenses that are out there. So there are updates that do come out for the Micro Four Thirds cameras. We are still supporting that system, um, you know, as we lead up to getting into the GH6 when that camera eventually comes. Uh, it's we're we're oh. so like there's so so much cool stuff going on that uh, I think a lot of times we forget that we're you know yes we're talking about full frame but we did also do some stuff for the Micro Four Thirds uh, group of shooters too. Today. Well, and remember with the GH5 Mark II when we first launched the the linear focus adjustment and the ability to choose the degrees of rotation, we just did a ton of firmware updates to lenses too. So if you haven't been updating your lenses um, and you're planning on getting a BGH1 or you already have a GH5 Mark II or a G9, uh, you're gonna wanna update those lenses so you can take advantage of the new lens throw options. Cause I, I oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're my, some of my favorite unique things we have in the S series product. And I'm so happy that it's moved its way down to G series. So I, I think <laughs> I'd be happy with it. Same so, here, same here. On. Yeah, um, let's see here. Um, so that actually addresses uh, Timothy's question as well. Um, another one is, will Lumix be working with Atomos for touchscreen menu controls? Uh, I know that this has been brought up a couple of times uh, in some of the people that have been reviewing, talking about uh, using the Atomos monitor, since you can do ProRes RAW with the Atomos monitor by taking the RAW output signal from the uh, BS1H or a BGH1. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add for that, Matt, other than um, I think you'd have to check with Atomos uh, as to the status of things like that. Yeah, so there's the th there's what's theoretically possible, right? And then there's what is technically possible. So um, the control of our camera on the BS1H and the BGH1, let's, let's keep it BGH1 right now because this is not officially a part of the BS1H right now. But um, with port keys, the BGH1 
Um, they're utilizing the USB-C port on our camera, connecting it to the port keys monitor, and then um, they can control the camera through that USB port. And they can do things like pull up the camera's menu and control the whole menu system through touchscreen. They can do autofocus through the system. And then they can adjust things like ISO, iris, um, shutter speed, things like that um, through that remote port. Um, it is technically possible with some of the Atomos products to use that remote port that's on the side of the camera and do some basic control things like uh, f-stop, shutter speed, things like that. Um, that would be something that is technically possible. And, you know, I've had, obviously we've had conversations about this. Um, it, it, it comes down to, you know, Atomos is a very busy company. A lot of companies are wanting to add features like RAW. And so I think some of this is gonna come down to, you know, how much time can they dedicate to make it work for that, which um, we'd love to see them do. And frankly, we don't blame them if they can't get it done. That's completely understandable. Um, and they may not find that that's a useful enough feature to, to be worth, to, to implement. And that's, again, I love Atomos recorders. <laughs> so I, I have, I'll never criticize the decisions they have to make because they, they run a company that um, has to work with a lot of different camera manufacturers. Um, but keep another thing in mind, they really don't have a USB port either. So there's not really a way for them to be able to integrate that USB control that we, that we have with port keys. So um, these are things we've always talked about and, and I'm always in conversation with the guys at Atomos. And um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm sure if enough people request it and there's enough of demand, that they'll happily do what they can to integrate at a minimum to the remote port. Yeah, yeah. I think that is a perfect answer for a question like that. <laughs> um, let's hear. Uh, JC's asking on the BGH1 and the VS1H is wireless streaming a possibility at some point via firmware, or are there hardware limitations preventing it? Um, I know we've asked for it. Um, so when you hear when you hear um and Sean <laughs> shift uncomfortably in his chair. <laughs> um, that is like the worst poker tell I've ever seen in my entire life. This is so, why I don't gamble. Yeah. Um, <laughs> look, again, we have to prioritize what's where we think the most demand will be for the product. And because of the lack of internal monitoring, um, it made more sense for us to make sure we had a robust uh, Ethernet solution for streaming and to make sure we have a, a reasonably useful USB-C streaming option as well that yeah. works with the protocols most people would use for USB-C. So the bulk of our efforts have been there. Um, I, I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to pull the wool over your eyes. <laughs> you guys know there's a lot of shared compatibility with some of these products. Um, you know, a GH5 Mark II clearly has shown the way for live streaming. Um, that doesn't mean it's not on our to-do list or something we're, we're considering. Again, it really comes down to how many people request it. And if there's enough requests for something like this um, and we see that it, there's a market need, you know, we'll absolutely, it'll, they'll make it happen. It's just a question of whether or not there's enough market need for it. Or is it more important than some other things that we have planned for the product that we're working on that we can't even tell you about right now? Um, so, you know, just keep that in mind. We're, we're we're will, really well known for doing firmware updates and unlocking lots of cool stuff in these products. And uh, the S1, the BS1H has shipped with a lot of stuff already unlocked. You had to wait months for on the other cameras. So I promise you we're working on other stuff and hopefully Wi-Fi streaming is one of those things that makes the list. Yeah. So uh, let's hear uh, another question here came in from Super Zero. Uh, it says with RAW coming to the iPhone 13, which um, I think we need to clarify the iPhone 13 is not getting raw video. It has, it, ha, it, it can do what I, what's Apple's like photo raw format called. Is it like pro raw or whatever that oh, is for still Apple, shooting? Apple raw. There's a photo raw feature that they've added yeah. and then they just, and then they've just added pro res for the iPhone 13 pros, right? The, yeah. And so, it's either 1080. If, it, it really depends on how much heart, how much um, SSD space, how much, storage you have in your phone, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Because they're, they're, they're smart. They know that like two minutes of recording time is not going to do anybody any good in 4K. So you no. can do 1080 in some models. You can do 4K in other models, depending on how much storage you have. Yeah. But that's, yeah. Not, but that's not raw. That's just ProRes. Yeah. So, so the, the question was, you know, with 
under the assumption in, in this point that, you know, with RAW coming to the iPhone 13, uh, how ubiquitous will it be for Lumix cameras? And will the likes of a GH5 Mark II, with the likes of a GH5 Mark II, is it as simple as something as a firmware update? Um, I, what I can say is, obviously, with the the information that we've just kind of shared, that, one, the iPhone 13 does not do RAW internally for video. Um, it, it, it just doesn't. Uh, with us, I mean, if you look at what how, how many cameras we have currently that have the ability to shoot raw video over HDMI, um, you know, I I would be comfortable in saying that it is a fairly important thing for a number of these kinds of cameras that we're coming out with. Uh, I think what a lot of people also kind of have to maybe check in the assumptions of the way the industry is moving is that raw over HDMI is still a relatively new technology, I guess you'd call it. Uh, for cameras. Um, so yeah, the fact that we've got it, it's really, it's who can develop it fastest and who can actually implement usable, reliable ways to be doing it. So you're not having to dive through menus to change which flavor you want to use, or, you know, you're not line skipping and binning to get a wider field of view. You actually want to do raw video. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add for that, Matt. No, we're always listening. So, um, yeah. frankly, I'm just jealous of ProRes and channel recording. I think that's really cool. You can do that in an iPhone. So, I, yeah. Um, again, some question marks about the usefulness of that for a phone, but um, it is a very cool feature that they've added. And, uh, you know, we, we listen. Everybody knows that uh, ProRes is a standard. We'll listen and see what we can do. But, I can promise you this, none of the current cameras can ever do ProRes internal. Uh, they just don't have the data throughput right now to be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, so let's hear, uh, one of the questions, uh, now that every camera, now that every manufacturer has a mirrorless camera, can we finally drop the micro and just refer to it as four thirds cameras? So, um, how, how many of you have ever heard of the, the lens mount that was available before micro four thirds? <laughs> I actually wonder how many people in the chat that are joining us ever were shooting with these cameras when four thirds cameras were actually a thing. Um, but yeah, uh, joke yeah. aside, that, that was a former lens mount. Yeah. So. You have to remember four thirds is a mount um, and a sensor size. So if we change the name, then people would be confused when they see somebody eBaying out a four thirds lens, and they think they can mount it to their camera. So that, that's why we keep the micro four thirds. Yeah. That we're proud of our size. We, we like being smaller. So. Yeah. No, I mean, and, and that's that's kind of what's so cool about the, the BS1H and the BGH1 too. And we didn't really talk about it much yet. Is that, you know, the size of the BGH1, it's a small camera. I mean, it's not that much smaller than a GH5S. It's, you know, it's obviously, it's in, it's in a different form factor that gets you all of the IO that we've put on that camera. But... The fact that the BS1H is legitimately the same size as the BGH1 with a sensor that's four times larger than it, and I think, what is it, it's 0.8 of a millimeter longer just because of the focal di uh, flange focal distance on the, the mount for the L-mount, I think that's a pretty, pretty dang impressive uh, uh, feat that our engineers were able to do to put something like this together. So yeah, with all the same with all the same unlimited recording times you get out of an S1H. So yeah, you know we we shaved almost half the weight um, when they did that. Uh, 0.8 millimeters doesn't quite make up the difference. I know someone's going to check us in the in the facts on the. Uh, they're going to be like, well, it's only 19.25 versus 20 millimeters, but there, I'm sure that there's some differences <laughs> in how thick the sensor is and things that had to be moved back. Um, the, yeah. the, the point is, yeah. is that you know, the only dimension that really changed is the front plate. Um, it's entirely on the front plate <laughs> and that's really around the circle where the, where the function buttons are. Uh, so the nice thing is that from our testing, every cage that's already out there for BGH1 with one exception, um, still works with it. Um, if you invested in an eight SIN, um, that's eight IS, I'm sorry, eight S I N N that one may be a challenge to get it to fit in this, with this camera. But if you have the small HD, you have the Zacuto, if you've got the, uh, Tilta, if you have the wooden camera cage, um, they all 
work just fine with it. Uh, we've been using those cages throughout um, this process. They work great. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. What else we got here? Um, Super Zero, unfortunately, uh, we can't comment uh, anything else than what has already been announced with the GH6. So sorry about that. Um, John FD Times is asking, is there a full frame anamorphic D squeeze on the BS1H? Since you're the anamorphic guy, Matt, you want to take that one? From FD Times? John Fowler? Is that John Fowler? <laughs> what was the person's name? I'm trying to find it in here. John FD Times. That might be. That is John Fowler. That would be John Fowler at Film and Digital Times. Hey, John. How are you? So, um... Let's see here. Is the full frame anamorphic D squeeze on the BS1H? Uh, yes, there is D squeeze. Um, you can do D squeeze over the SDI. So we can output the D squeeze. And uh, like the uh, S1H, we can do 1.3, 1.33, 1.5, 1 1.8, and 2x D squeeze. We can also do the D squeeze. And this is something Sean and I play with periodically. We can do the D squeeze over the USB C, and we can also do it over the Ethernet port. The one port we cannot de-squeeze is over the HDMI. So um, you'll have to rely on de-squeeze in the monitor if you're going to be doing any uh, HDMI monitoring. Yeah, although that, that does introduce that, that kind of cool way that we did the uh, anamorphic uh, live stream a couple of months back. Or Actually, wow, so it's a year ago at this point. Where it's literally mm. SDI out into a uh, Atomos Ninja recorder and then HDMI out from the Atomos into my switcher <laughs> because yeah. you can then force the the uh, monitor to be doing the de-squeeze out. Yeah. That was actually kind of fun. And it's actually something that I... Was I our Christmas, that was our Christmas special. That was. Hey, your lights just turned off, Matt. Yeah. Maybe you should take me <laughs> off screen for a second so I can Yeah, that. sure. All right. Uh, so let's see here. Let's uh, go through a couple more questions while Matt is fixing some of that stuff up. Um... So, uh, yeah, we were at uh, Anamorphic D-Squeeze. Yeah, so um, let's see if we tag. Oh, yeah, okay, thank you, Keith. As a reminder, tag at Lumix Cameras uh, for us to address your questions during the stream. Um, Christopher's asking, will NDI be an option in the future for either box cameras? Um, I'm actually going to wait for Matt to come back to address this one um, because him and I have actually had a lot of conversations about NDI uh, integration. Um so we, we will touch on that, and Matt is back. So, hi, Matt. Welcome back. That was sheer laziness, folks. Sheer laziness. Um, I have these... I have these gigantic V-mount batteries that I use to power my light instead of taking the time to run a power cord over to my wall. So uh, I thought that would last more than two hours. <laughs> so apparently I was wrong. Um, anyways... So NDI, so there's, there's a question about there's NDI, there's NDIHX. Uh, Panasonic does support NDIHX in some of our products. Um, they're primarily on the broadcast side. So cameras like the uh, 350, um, the, the X10, uh, those cameras can, the CX10 can do that. Uh, we've talked about it internally. Um, we had initially thought a lot of folks would rely more on RTSP for streaming. Um, because it gives them access to 4K for streaming. Um, and it has about the same latency that we were experiencing over NDI. So, uh, and frankly, a lot of NDI switchers can work with RTSP as a protocol. So that's really what we did, but we are getting a lot of requests for it. I think people want the control over RTSP. I'm sorry, uh, control for NDI, I think is what a lot of people are looking for. Perhaps a little bit of an efficiency improvement over the compression when it comes down the line. So um, we're asking for it. Uh, there might be a possibility we can integrate it, but um, at this point, I don't think we're ready to comment on it now. Um, I just wanted you to understand what we do as an alternative, which is RTSP. That is way more information than I would have been able to give. So thank you, Matt. Um, let's see here. Uh, a couple of the other questions. Um, can you chat about the new button layout and why it's changed from the BGH1, or did I miss that bit already? Um, yeah, let's actually, I'm going to switch to my camera real quick, Matt. Your audio is still up, so you, so we can talk, um, so I can show people the new button layout. Yeah. All right. So there's a, there's a practical reason, and then there's a what makes Matt happy reason. Um, by the way, you need to cover your face if you want that thing to focus on the camera. Well, remember, you're <laughs> looking at a different camera. 
Okay. Oh, and never mind. I'll just keep my mouth shut now. Um, thank you very much. It's kind of like I've been doing these things for a while. <laughs> okay. So um, there's a different release for the lens. Um, and that's because the L mount puts its release in a different place. And that's where one of the buttons lived on the BGH one. So when they had to move that button, they said, well, where are we going to be able to put function keys? And we received quite a bit of feedback that people um, were frustrated with having to hunt around the camera body to get to the different function keys. So they decided to put them all down one side and it's all yeah. on, if you're from behind, it'd be your left hand that can access them. So you can have a handle on the right side, you can access all the function keys now and it added one additional function key. Now, the biggest piece of feedback I got from a couple of DOPs was uh, they see this product as being something great for uh, like coverage. So they're doing like a big production with like a large cinema camera, like a very cam, right? And they still want to be able to stick something under the dashboard of a car or on top of the dashboard, or, you know, they're doing something where they need a really small camera. So they want to just be able to stick this thing and hide it up underneath the dashboard, for example, and they don't want people touching it. So they wanted a lock and this camera has a lock on the front of it now. And it's pretty amazing what all you can program um, either to have work or have not work when you flip the lock switch. And that was a really highly regarded feature, which I was really surprised at how excited people were for that lock switch. So um, that just makes me really excited that um, that our engineers listen that closely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and there's just like the whole nice thing that like, so when I have mine mounted up onto my, uh, my RSC2, you know, the fact that all of the function buttons are on the side that's not, you know, part of the actual gimbal arm makes it a lot easier that if I do have to actually reach up and hit one of these buttons for some reason, you know, I'm not having to like do that weird kind of like claw thing to get behind and then hit it and then not have to throw everything off. So it actually makes it a, a pretty nice kind of setup for anybody that's shooting, especially if you're handheld and you have a handle on the right hand side. Now all of your function buttons are all on one side. So it's one hand access for this stuff. Uh, makes it a pretty nice little setup. Um, there's one comment in here I want to make sure we get to right away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, go for so, it. So, uh, so I understand the camera is 4K, um, and frankly, it's also 6K. But uh, we supply a 3G SDI out, and so yes. there, there there are some questions as to why we don't supply a 6G or a 12G SDI out. Um, and you know, some of these are going to come down to cost and how it, how much it would cost to be able to integrate something like that, and the time it takes to engineer and develop. Uh, the ability to do this. Um, but some of this really just comes down to market need. And I realize on this particular forum, this may be a controversial set of comments I'm about to make, but- Are you gonna make the in, news later today, Matt? I don't, nah, hopefully not. <laughs> um, nobody is broadcasting live 4K content with 4K sourced cameras in the United States. So if you're watching a 4K broadcast of an NBA basketball game, or you're watching, you know, Fox is gonna do a 4K broadcast probably this Thursday of an NFL football game. Um, and you watch that through Fox Now or through their, their app. Um, they're actually sourcing that from 1080 content over 1080 SDI stream. <laughs> and then they're doing an up conversion and then they're doing a color correction to create their, their HDR files. Um, the infrastructure for live broadcast is so expensive to update that nobody has endeavored to make any meaningful investment to be able to do 6G or 12G. So even when you watch a broadcast of a live event that if it was sourced on 4K cameras, chances are it's actually four 3G SDI streams that are assembled in the switcher. And so a switcher that can accommodate 32 cameras you're gonna cut that in by a quarter. So you're only gonna be able to accommodate a quarter of as many cameras when you do 4K live output. Now I'm not talking live streaming per se, I'm talking about live broadcast. And so they're the number one use case for SDI. Um, the number two case would be like production. So, you know, I might need to run an SDI cable back to Video Village and I'm showing a client the, the production as it's being shot. And, 
again, when we look at the production monitors that dominate the use case in this, um, they may accept a 6G or 12G SDIN, but the monitor itself is small and doesn't necessarily give you 4K resolution. And a lot of times what's really being sent is a wireless transmission through a device like a Teradek where we're taking SDI out and putting it into a Teradek transmitter. That transmitter is then going wireless. And up until recently, 4K transmitters that accepted SDI and then did it wirelessly didn't really even exist. So the, the need for a 6G or 12G SDI signal is for a very, very small subset of the community that's out there using these products right now. Um, again, would we like to have a 12G SDI out so we can use different external recorders and give you a raw output? Of course, we would, we would love to do that. But how many people really need that and how many of them would be willing to pay the extra cost increase it would take for us to be able to apply it? So um, I hope that explains it. I know there's a lot of misconceptions yeah. about live broadcast and 4K and versus 1080, but you know, in most countries, and it's very, very minimal amount of live broadcast that's actually in 4K. And so that's why it's just not in there. Um, so go ahead and flame me right now in the comment section and let's go ahead and see what people have to say. No, I, you know, I, that's, that's, I think, you know, we, we've had this conversation a lot because I didn't really understand a whole lot about, you know, how the broadcast side actually works when it comes to things like SDI. I know that, yes, there is the, the nice benefit that it's a locking port. You're not going to have to worry about it coming out of the camera. And that was kind of one of the biggest, uh, and long cable runs, really yeah, long cable yeah, runs. Yeah, very long cable runs. Um, and I know that for a lot of people, that's what, you know, kind of really they like about the port. But, you know, the fact is most most people, if, if you're creating content online, if you're creating, you know, uh, brought like YouTube broadcasting or new media type content, you probably either don't, one, you either don't have the infrastructure for uh, SDI anyway, in 6G or 12G in your own home to do it. So you're probably still relying on HDMI since that's what is still standard in the vast majority of consumer products. So I think what, to balance out what, what you were saying, Matt, I think it's also that like, look, things take time to change. And like you said, how, how long has 12G and 6G SDI been out to where broadcast could possibly start switching over to it. You're still probably a number of years away with it. So it's not it's not like it'd be like an awesome cool thing to have, but you know, it's just what is actually available in the market, what the vast majority of people are going to be utilizing and I think you hit it right on the head. How many people are going to be willing to pay an extra premium for something that they don't use or can't utilize? So so just wanted to get that out there. Um and again, we would love to have it. We just don't <laughs> think there's enough of a need for it. You know, uh, there's a lot of things I'd love for the camera to have. Many, many things I would love for the camera to have. But I also have to be realistic in how many other people would want the camera to have the things that I would want it to have. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let's see here. Um, is the rolling shutter improved or does it have the same as the S1H at full frame 4K? Um, well, uh, it's it's an S1H in a box camera, um, yeah, no one so uh, no one yeah, there's there's no change as far as image quality goes, recording uh, functionality, uh, bit rates, uh, resolutions, frame rates, everything that you have in an S1H is the same as what you have on a BS1H. They are really at heart, it's the same camera internally, but. It, I think, kind of epitomizes that point of using the cameras in ways that are, you know, they're kind of best designed for. Not everyone's going to want to run around and, and handhold something like this because, well, one, it doesn't have an in-body image stabilizer. It's a much smaller, lighter platform because some of that stuff gets taken out because it's not as needed in environments like this. So, yeah, it, it, it gets you all the same things that you would expect out of your, your S1H. And I, I forget whose video it was. Uh, it might've been, might've been one of the, the media reviewers that were up uh, right at the launch with it, but they pointed it out. 
I think, perfect for most people. The S1H is still going to be an amazing camera for run-and-gun filmmakers, people who need, uh, you know, the EVF, that want to have full touchscreen built onto the camera, that need to have, uh, you know, the in-body stabilization because you don't want to rig it up as a gimbal. That's still going to be the better camera for you in most cases, but... This one, if you need, if you want crazy long battery life because you've got the VBR style batteries, if you want to be able to have, um, you know, a camera mounted onto a vehicle, if you want to be able to have it fit in locations where you can't really fit an S1H, then yeah, this is infinitely going to be a better product for platforms like that. Like after that report that came out, uh, it wasn't really a report. It was the comments that Apple made about, Motorcycle vibrations uh, destroying optical uh, image stabilization systems in mobile devices. Yeah, these are much better to put on vehicles that, or, or anything that's going to vibrate at a high frequency, even if there's not a hundred percent, you know, effect on all products. Like I, I'm much more comfortable putting a camera like this and strapping it to my motorcycle than strapping an S1H. Plus, it's half the weight, so you know that's definitely a nicer thing to deal with too. So. so there's there's another there's another comment from a Greg a Greg Greenhaw which um, revolves around neutral density filters and mm -hmm. a comment about phase autofocus. So uh, on the on the on the phase front, um, we we don't have it, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, <laughs> on the ND filter side, uh, let's talk about ND because mm -hmm. it. I think again, there's some misconceptions because of some of the marketing material that's out there and how certain cameras work with ND. So, yes. um, you know, most the, the lion's share of cameras that have built in ND filters have glass based tinted panes of glass. It's basically what they are, right? Um, special coatings, things like that, but it's effectively tinted glass panes and they're on like a carousel. So what they do is they'll roll into place and you'll have like three different densities or some companies will have like one that rolls in and then a second one to double that density. And then they'll add a third one to triple density. The point is, is that it's a physical object that has to be able to move in and out, okay? So there are some companies who have figured out ways to use liquid crystal displays um, in a transparent liquid crystal display that gets slid in front of the, the sensor and then they change the density of the material. Um, effectively, the, the pneumatic twisting and untwisting, they twist the crystal more, and then there's a, there's a, it's a phase change. So you're, you're actually using that against the polarizer. So there's a polarization change, and then we start to cancel out more light. And that's how that system works. Um, those systems also have to be moved out of the way because if they're in plane all the time with the liquid crystal display even turned off, it's going to at best consume one stop of light and in some cases much more. So we would have to be able to move that device physically out of the way. And the liquid crystal displays that are used are solid, non-curvable, non-flexible materials. So keep in mind that sensor is 36 millimeters wide in the BS1H and it is 24 millimeters tall. And we don't have any place we can move that inside the chassis of the camera. It just would, it would literally have to exit the side in order for us to be able to move it out of the way and then put it back into place. And so there's just no way we can move them. And, and so to get the size where we needed the size to be, that was a compromise that we had to make. So um, whether it's the Zcam product, which has a slide in ND filter, which is a nice little dust trap, by the way, for dust to be able to enter, or it's the Sony products like the FX9 that use a liquid crystal system that has to literally slide into place um, to be used. No matter what, they're moving it out of the way when it's not in use. Um, yep. And that, that's something we just can't do. Yeah. I hope that answers it. <laughs> no, I mean, that, that, that I think is like the, the, best explanation I've heard of it. You know, it's, it's cool to, to have the, the goal that you want to have NDs into these ultra small cameras, but at some point, um, you know, the technology is just not caught up to where we want things to be. Um, you said it before about how many things we'd love to have in these cameras. I know you and I talked about it at, at length when we were talking about the, even the BGH one, when it came out, if that thing had, if if there was technology available to do internal ND filters, that would be awesome. 
That would be amazing. And I'm sure everyone in the chat would love it and then find something else to have a problem with because <laughs> it's the internet and it's just how the world works. Sean, I don't, I don't believe anybody on this call would believe me if I expressed the amount of creative thinking that you and I have put into <laughs> ND designs for the camera. And um, it's just not going to happen. We really yeah. thought, trust me, I have been as far outside of the box on neutral density filter as any human being that you have ever met. And I'm sure Sean can attest to this. And oh, yeah. it, it's just not a simple process for a camera that's this small. Yeah. So, you know, stuff, stuff like that, you know, obviously comments like this are not to defer, uh, deter anybody from, you know, giving us this feedback. It's just like the, the autofocus conversation. I see one of the questions here is where can you write in a request for better autofocus? Like, look, we hear it and, and we know that, you know, these are things that everybody wants. And, you know, in, in the most part, there are, there's a lot of things where Matt and I, well, at least I can agree. I'm not going to speak for Matt. Where, where I can agree with a lot of the things that people ask for. Um, and that's exactly why we have this platform is that y'all are commenting here and, and giving a, you know, pu putting in your two cents. That's what helps us go back to our teams and say, hey, you know, this is something that a ton of people have been asking about. Can you guys look into it and see if it's something that actually can be done? So it really helps us get this stuff um, set up. So let's yeah. see here. And, 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 and by the way, we have made pretty radical improvements in our autofocus system over the years. And oh, yeah. the B, the BS1H, uh, again, it's all going to be left to interpretation. It also depends on what frame rate you like to shoot at. You know, people who shoot at 30 and 60 frames a second, probably perfectly happy with the autofocus system that exists. 24 frame is where kind of our Achilles heel would be, um, just the yeah. way the system has to work. Um, so just, just keep that in mind. Some people are going to be perfectly happy with the autofocus because the frame rates are shooting at. Um, yeah. And a lot of broadcast is going to be, especially like YouTube-based broadcast is probably going to be at 30 frames or 60 frames. So um, Sean and I are at 60 frames right now. That's, that's what we shoot at for this stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah. You know, it, it just really depends on your needs. Yeah. So let's see here. Uh, Victor was asking, what's the price point of this camera? So um, the BS1H is... Thirty-four ninety-nine and ninety-nine cents. Correct, Matt. <laughs> Repeat the question one more time. Sorry, I, I'm not as the good price. as you. I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Thirty-four ninety-nine and ninety-nine yeah. cents. Thirty-four ninety-nine ninety-nine. Um, let's see here. Uh, Alan points out Tilted just brought out the Mirage for remote VND on matte boxes. I did read about that. Um, I think a couple people were having a conversation over on the Facebook group about that, which is something uh, you know to take a look at. There, that's, that's what I think polarized, is. Yeah. That's two polarized glass panels with a remote control device, similar to a new Let you just kind of rotate yeah. them. It's yeah. a cool. It's a very cool solution. Um, yeah. Again, could, couldn't couldn't integrate it inside our cameras, obviously. Yeah. But uh, I think what Alan's pro professing is that it's a nice alternative um, if you needed something with some variable neutral density. Yeah, yeah, and you know that that's that's I think a, a, a nice thing too is like just that. Yes, this is uh, this is something that we'd want to eventually be able to put into the cameras, but there are so many good options out there that, you know, no company, I, 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 th I think it's safe to say that no company is sitting still on any of these kinds of ideas. You know, everyone wants to be the first one to, you know, start miniaturizing hardware much faster. I mean, it was... It's crazy already to think that this is the same internals as the S1H minus the stabilization unit um, that you've got, you know, that you've got in the same exact platform as the BGH1, which is a micro four third sensor. So that's already a huge sizing down of general technology. Eventually, you start seeing things catch up uh, more and more. I think, um, you know, you just got to give give good technology time. Uh, when whenever Panasonic decides to deploy things in our cameras, we typically wait until it's actually like a viable solution and not just like something out on a whim. You know, maybe it's going to work. So, you know, you get really good reliability with our stuff. So uh, Scott Warren made a very interesting comment, which has to do with how good our long GOP C4K 10 bit holds up at 150 megabits. Um, Sean and I are not going to have an answer as to what our engineers did to make that work. Uh, those guys, Magic. those guys obsess over encoding. I mean, there's literally like a staff of engineers 
whose sole responsibility it is, is to design encoding technologies and then patent those encoding technologies. Panasonic has historically created more patents per year than any other manufacturer. Um, and so you have entire staffs that are out there looking for ways to improve compression algorithms. Um, yeah. Frankly, the H.265 is shocking to me how well it holds up as well on the camera. So oh, yeah. um, I, I thank you for the comment. I wish I knew, but temporal noise reduction algorithms and things like that just do not get me all that excited. And when they try to explain it to me, I have no idea what they're talking about nine times out of ten. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. Uh, oh, let's, let's talk about uh, Christopher's question. Um, about using gyroscopic information. So, yep. um, you know, it, it would be interesting if we could, in, if we were to want to integrate a gyroscope in the camera to be able to do that. Um, you know, we've looked at what some other companies are doing with that. So, you know, one challenge is you're going to have to crop the image a little bit. So, it it would require some thought in the capture phase, right, to make sure that you don't shoot too tight to make that work. Um, but yeah, we're we're well aware of other companies are doing, and we we find it fascinating. And I'm sure that we're looking at stuff like that right now. Um, we, we certainly requested it and we've, we've pointed them in the direction. They know exactly what's going on with it. So um, I can't promise anything, but we are well aware of it. We think it's cool stuff. Yeah. So um, let's see here. Uh, I did want to address this one uh, from Super Zero. It says, uh, your explanation about mounting, mounting cameras on motorcycles, I thought that was the reason the GH5S existed without IBIS. So now the BGH1. Does this mean the GH5S will not have a successor? Um, so that's a, it's, that's a bit of a loaded kind of question. Cause one, like we said, we can't answer questions or comment about futures of products or things like that. We just don't have any answer with that. Um, but know that basically the BGH one, don't think of it as necessarily like say a replacement to a GH five S in the same way that the BS one H is not a replacement for the S one H they sit side by side with each other in a lot of ways because you've got cameras now that can work incredibly well for very different applications. Um, in my example there of mounting a camera up onto my motorcycle, it's going to be fairly similar with cars. I mean, you know, you've, a lot of people have seen for many years that, you know, shows like Grand Tour and Top Gear always had, you know, GH cameras. They had, you know, other kinds of cameras like that in the cars when they're shooting, well, when you can switch into something like this that has your SDI, that has gen lock, that has time code, it makes the shooting more efficient, much easier, where it doesn't mean that the other camera still doesn't have a place. It just means that this is the better tool for the job. And while, yes, a lot of the evolution of mirrorless cameras has been get a camera that can be very flexible for both sides of the industry, for both photo and video as the hybrid mentality, there are still a lot of cases where having a dedicated tool that has the proper IO, the proper build quality, the proper design is still going to be the better choice for you. So the BS1H and the BGH1 in an automotive sense, I think are going to be like some of the perfect cameras for it. Because you're not, especially the BS1H, because you're not increasing your size compared to a BGH1 if you're already deploying a micro four thirds platform. Now you've got a full frame platform that is the same exact size for 90% of the time, the same cages, uh, and you're getting that up to 6K recording. So post stabilization is going to be super easy because you've got more resolution to work with. Um, yeah. yeah, that's my so little spiel on that one. And I guess before we talk about a GH5S replacement, let's let's get the GH6 out first and see what that thing can do. Yeah. So until we until we even know what that camera can do, I'm not even thinking about a GH5S or 6S or GHTK421. I have no idea what we'll do. Um, <laughs> at, at this point, let's just wait and see what the GH6 has to offer before we start thinking about an S variant of it. Yeah. Um. Here's one for you, Matt, because you and I were actually talking about this earlier. We talk about a lot of things, it seems, that end up getting brought up on these chats. It's kind of like we listen to what people say and prepare for certain conversations. Um, yeah. Michael Lee asks, is the lens mount stronger or more rigid for PL adapters like the wooden camera one? 
uh, <sighs> like wooden camera than the S1H. Uh, I see that there was a break there and a continuation for the question. Could you enlighten us about what's so special with the mount on the BS1H and the S1H? I'll, I'll, I'll enlighten if you can show. So, um, yeah. so the truth is, is that you're going to have the same mount, whether it's the BS1H or the S1H. Uh, but there's a little trick people don't realize that the mount has um, that uh, companies like uh, Sigma and also our friends at Hot Rod Camera have figured out, which is there's a little tiny screw hole right in the mount. And so Sigma and Hot Rod, when you'd use their PL adapters and you twist it on there, they've included a little channel and a screw that will let you screw that mount into our mount. And so the twisting that you may experience with uh, other adapters, you're not going to experience with those two adapters. So um, it effectively kind of bonds it to it. And I've held some just stupidly heavy lenses on there with no support underneath, um, like embarrassingly heavy lenses that I shouldn't admit I used without a support, like a hundred millimeter Atlas anamorphic lens with no support. Um, and I've had, it, 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 it works exceedingly well, <laughs> trust me. Now, um, I, I would always recommend still adding a support on a lens that's that big, um, mostly because I'm not, not so worried about bending the mount or causing a, the, the biggest issue is that you can actually cause some focus issues. Um, we ran into this recently where we had <laughs> lent out a camera and at Cinegear, uh, we were like, huh, why does this camera look awful? <laughs> we had this S1 H set up with an Atlas uh, 50 millimeter anamorphic lens. And I'm like, what in the heck happened? So I ran, I ran the lens over to the Atlas booth. Thank God they were at the Cinecure show. And um, they put it on a test rig and they go, uh, your camera's flange back distance is two tenths of a millimeter out, which doesn't seem like much, that's a lot. So I pulled open the, the, the Sigma adapter and I realized someone had shimmed it without even thinking, without even testing. So we pulled the shim out and then we actually put the mount on, we put the lens back on, and then we were like out by a 10th. And so what I then did is I put the screw in to the mount on the Sigma mount, and that got us to within like a hundredth or like a, maybe a 200th of a millimeter, which was perfect for focusing because they give enough slack to go beyond infinity on those lenses. So <laughs> just to give you an idea of how critical these things can be, Somebody shimming your lens or your lens adapter without you knowing it can completely throw everything off. And even after you get it close to manufacturer tolerance, that extra screw made all the difference in the world to getting it to perfect infinity. <laughs> I Sorry, do have to it, was, say... it was appropriate for this conversation we were at. Oh yeah, no, I, I, I do have to say that first day at sitting here though was a lot of like, you know, we had been up since what, like two o'clock in the morning to catch our flight out of Dallas. By the end of that day and like having everything set up, none of us would have ever noticed that until we actually started setting everything up and actually, you know, kind of weren't running on fumes by that point. So, and, yes. And thank, and thank you to the guys at Atlas for having the device to be able to actually check. It's a little piece that you just stick right on the front. It has a little LED light in the back of it that you turn on and it allows you to determine how far out of spec your, your flange back distance is. Um, thank you guys for your help because that was... That was embarrassing. I was so embarrassed by the way that thing looked, and I was, I was and of course, of course, I work for Panasonic. Who am I blaming? I'm blaming Atlas. So why would I take any responsibility for this? It couldn't be me. Um, so the point being is that that screw makes sense. Plus, it keeps it from yeah. flexing down. And we didn't have any support under that 50 millimeter at the show whatsoever, and it held up perfectly fine with just that Sigma mount and the screw mounted to it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's see here. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions, and then we're actually going to call it um, for today. Um, we have one, one request here, which is uh, something I want to make sure I read out so that I remember to bring this up with uh, our teams. Uh, please let your team know how to integrate with Unreal Engine. Um, can we speak about the camera tracking integration? So it's something that is on a wish list for working with Unreal Engine. So um, yeah, let's uh, let's communicate to our team and see what would be needed or if it's already there. So probably need to first communicate to Unreal Engine to find out what they need. So I'll 
that's that's a business development thing. That's yeah, on me, Sean. Go. So you you make you make the uh, you make the comparison sheet between S1H and BS1H, and I'll work on Unreal Engine. Hey, there you go. Um, let's see here. Do you have any update on increasing the font size on a BGH1? Um, so IMCE, uh, I think you had asked this question actually a number of weeks ago, uh, and we had actually looked at it. Um, so I'm not sure if you know what this uh, question's about, Matt, but in certain monitors, when you're sending the info display out, you know, you're stuck with whatever resolution the info display is sent out at. Um, yeah. So one of the question what questions was, is it possible to scale that font size larger for certain monitors. Um, I know that I've brought it up uh, to some of our team. I'll bring it up on my side. Over there. I'll bring it up on and my then, side yeah. too. So yeah, I'll we'll, we'll uh, keep keep pressing on, on stuff like that. So Honest, Honestly, I hadn't even thought of it, but you are 100% correct. Um, I could absolutely see where if you have a monitor, like a small monitor with 4K resolution and you're outputting that to an actual like 4K display or something. Yeah. Yeah, I could see where, I could see where that might be a challenge. So let me, let me see what we can do. <laughs> Um, let's see here. Uh, probably the last question that we're going to take, uh, cause we're at about an hour and 15 minutes. Or it's actually about an hour and 10 minutes running here. Um, so, uh, I know people are wishing for NDs built in. Do you have any thoughts on technology processing where you can go beyond dual native ISO and reduce the sensitivity to may to maybe do something similar? Do I have do a thoughts? similar goal? Do, do I have thoughts? <laughs> Of That's kind of like asking water thoughts. if it's wet. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously, we have lots of thoughts. The, the problem is none of us can talk about those thoughts right now. Um, and, and frankly, it, it's something that everybody's working on on the sensor side. So oh, yeah. um, I'll just leave it at that. But we absolutely have thoughts, not just us, but everybody who's making sensors have thoughts. And there's a lot of people working on different solutions. Um, we're probably still a few years away. Uh, and then just one last thing I want to make sure we comment on, which someone asked in the comments, mm -hmm. uh, the screw hole on the BS1H and the uh, the S1H. Uh, this is a real challenge, guys. Every time we pause before we say the name, is we're really just trying to remember which one we're talking about at this point. But all these names are pretty close. Um, so actually, that screw hole is also on the S5. So yes. uh, you won't find it on the S1 or the S1R because they were designed before that specification change to the L mount. Um, you literally had to submit a, a, sub, a submission to alter the mount had to be submitted by somebody and approved. I don't know if it was Panasonic who did it. I don't know if it was Leica. I don't know if it was Sigma. Somebody submitted it and it had to be approved by council. Um, so it was approved, but it only appears on newer cameras. So the S5 has it. Um, the first camera to get it was the S1H. So I would assume yeah. everything L mount from Panasonic S5, or sorry, S1H and newer will get that. Yeah, and and I think actually at that point, if it's actually part of the mount specification now, you may see that start to carry in with every L mount camera. But you'd have to check with with those other, other cameras, cameras as well. Um. All right. Um. Oh, here's one, Matt. We actually heard this at the trade show a lot. Uh, any chance of getting focusing squares like his Vericam? <laughs> oh, please keep asking. Ask, keep asking for that and keep asking for the EL exposure tool, please. Um, we would we would love to see both of those added. Just keep asking, please. Please make us yeah. think about it. Um, yeah. Because we, we, we're, we're equally as big of fans of those features as you guys are. <laughs> well, cool. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, Alan. Alan's throwing his question in again, too, about... Uh, Info display toggling specifically for SDI and HDMI independently rather than having to cycle through them um, as an efficiency for, because right now having to press the FN1 button over and over again to cycle through them. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, definitely continue to bring stuff like that up. So uh, thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, with that, uh, I think we're going to call it today. Um, thank you, Matt, for, for taking your part of your day. Um, obviously, you have some homework from from this stream today now too <laughs> both of us do <laughs> yeah hey thanks guys thanks for the extra work i'm obviously i'm joking that's what that's why we love these show and thanks sean for hosting this every week um uh you have you've carved out quite a nice platform i think it's very unique from other manufacturers so um we're trying I love the fact we get to share i love the fact we get to share stuff with you guys i wish we could share more but um uh, it's it's great feedback we get from all of you out there and frankly you're what make 
Lumix Lumix. So just keep asking for features. Keep getting frustrated because it's your frustrations that get us frustrated and help us to move forward. <laughs> yes, that is that is probably I, that's that's a you know what? I'm just going to shut up. I'm going to go with that one. That one's cool. <laughs> All right. All right, everybody. Well, again, Matt, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, I want to remind everybody here that um, where is it? There it is. I want to remind everybody about the Lumix Pro Services platform. We have the Lumix uh, Platinum, Lumix Pro Services Platinum and Red tier. Wow, I am totally tongue tied today. The red tier is our free membership that gets you your three-year manufacturer extended warranty, uh, gets you an online uh, platform for being able to track and uh, monitor your repairs and your services. Then we have the platinum level, which is the paid level, gets you your three-year manufacturer warranty extension. It also gets you uh, free next day shipping and two-day turnaround time for your repairs, 20% off out of warranty repairs, annual sensor cleanings, EVF cleanings, lens calibrations, and firmware updates, as well as that direct hotline into Panasonic Lumix. Uh, if you are interested in either of these, you can either take a look at lumix-pro.us if you're here in the United States, or you can take a look with the QR code that is up on your screen now. If you are joining us from outside of the United States, you can just take a quick Google for Lumix Pro Services. Uh, and you'll be able to see what's available in your region. Each region has slightly different requirements for the different tiers that they have out there, so make sure to consult with your local region as far as what's available. Outside of that, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for the questions and all the conversations that, that everyone had in the chat. Um, reminder, we will be live again next, uh, next Thursday, so next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, I'm going to be live with Carissa Dorson again, to talk about the uh, video piece that she shot on the BS1H uh, and be able to answer some questions about that. This entire month is gonna be devoted to BS1H, so we will have more streams coming out throughout the end of the month. If you haven't already, throw a like uh, on this video, subscribe to us if you've enjoyed the content here. It helps me out tremendously in being able to bring you guys more content and newer content. If you're not already doing so, make sure to head over to our Instagram page and give us a follow over there. That also helps me out. And that's also one of the areas that we're going to be uh, having more ability to just keep in, in contact with everybody outside of these weekly streams. So with that, thank you, everybody. And I will see you next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Take care.